name's Dan Shedler. I'm the founder and owner of Around the Bend Beer Company and one of the brewers here. Uh, Around the Bend started, well, let's see, last, last month was four years for us. We celebrated our fourth anniversary in May. Um, what we're all about is taking classic beer styles and imbuing them with an experimental edge. Uh, and in fact, that's even where the name of the company comes from, right? We feel like if you keep pushing boundaries, keep trying new things, you never know what's around the bend, right? So that's where that all comes from. I'm Ben Saller. I'm one of the founders of Burt City Brewing. This is my brother, John. I'm John Saller, one of the founders of District Brewery Yards and Burnt City Brewing. So Burnt City's been around for uh, about seven years now, but we're uh, happily moved into our new home at District Brew Yards. District Brew Yards is a collaborative uh, brewery um, and beer hall and retail shop uh, where we get to make a whole lot of fun beers in large and small batches uh, and let people enjoy them here and let people take them home in uh, nicely packaged cans and we also have facilities to brew on a large enough scale to distribute widely throughout the city and beyond. So uh, Brew Yards is uh, a collective, uh, I don't want to say experiment, but uh, kind of what it is. Uh, we are three distinct brands that are working together to do as much as possible as well as experiment as much as possible. So ourselves, Bulldog, with Burnt City and Around the Bend, uh, we all work really well together, bouncing ideas off of each other, different techniques, different uh, philosophies when it comes to beer. Um, and that's, that's what really is the, the my, I would say my personal favorite part of this is we didn't really work together before, but as soon as we started working together, we've quickly become friends. Um, you know, we're, we're always looking out for each other. We're trying to collaborate and just boost uh, each other as much as possible. So um, the, the concept was kind of born out of uh, our, our situation at our, our previous location. We formerly had a brew pub in Lincoln Park and a production brewery in Pullman. And uh, when we started to um, when we built out our production brewery, there were only uh, about a third the number of breweries in the country that there are now. This was four years ago, so um, things changed very rapidly. We uh, had excess tank capacity because we uh, we planned a little bit uh, on a more grand scale than, than was really feasible. Um, and so we started working with Around the Bend. They needed a place to brew their beer. And so we started um, sharing our facilities and that was working out really well. And we were uh, doing that for over a year when um, it uh, came time for us to uh, potentially, uh, there was no um, beef with our landlords at either location. We just had the opportunity to move and we thought it would be really great to have all of our uh, brewery equipment and all of our staff under one roof in, in a location that was maybe a little bit more uh, uh, conducive to um, getting customers in the door uh, um, and we found this space and we decided that we wanted to do something different and uh, so the idea of being a collective and um, for some purposes uh, a kind of incubator for smaller brands at times um, sounded really appealing and um, then we decided we were going to take it a step further with the self-pour taps. Um, bought a big old smoker to kick out some great barbecue and it's all come together really nicely. It's not a completely, totally unique notion in the world of craft beer today, but it's really about the execution and how we go about leveraging that, right? So by way of example, uh, our best selling beer is called Vera. It's a pistachio cream ale. Who's ever had a pistachio cream ale, right? We're the only ones who make one as far as I know. One of my favorite parts about this entire thing is uh, you know, Burnt City has a different philosophy on beers than Around the Bend has on beers that uh, our Bulldog has on beers. Um, we all kind of have our uh, quirks, but in the most positive uh, definition of the word. Um, and it's just been great. So we never got to do anything like this before. Uh, you know, we have 10 taps right now. The most that we were doing at our old facility was maybe two beers at a time, maybe three. Um, 
if one product wasn't selling quickly. Uh, you know, just being honest about it, some of our products didn't move that quickly. Now we are, now we're able to experiment, now we can do different styles, we can try different things, uh, and it's not as big of a risk. Uh, you know, up until two months ago, my wife and I were still working full-time jobs. I have been able to uh, step away from that and focus just on and it's helped increase our brand uh, about tenfold. And I would guess by the end of the year, that our barrel production will be at least tenfold from what we did. We did uh, 76 barrels of production last year and I think we're on track to do anywhere from 700 to 800 this year. So uh, that's a huge, it's super exciting and uh, it's kind of the best job in the world to have right now because what is my job besides talking about beer with people that like beer? We do really, you know, inventive things, not only using adjuncts, but the system I'm standing next to here is a really great example of the kinds of things that we're trying to bring to the market. This is an Erzatz uh, Burton Union fermentation system. Basically all that means is the Burton Union is an old way of making beer where they used to actively ferment beer in wooden barrels, and that's what we're doing here. What that means is we're actively fermenting the beer inside of these oak barrels. When the croissant comes bubbling out, it's collected via these hoses in this manifold and goes down through the big hose into this um, temperature controlled mini FV. It's got a heating coil as well as a cooling unit so we can keep the temperature exactly where we want it, keep the bugs nice and happy until we want to repitch. So really fun kind of stuff like that results in beautiful, light, effervescent, very lightly soured beers. Um, so we try to take not only new kinds of ingredients, but new processes, new ways of thinking about how can we push craft forward, right? How do we take this thing further? I think there was a point where we realized that the future of like true craft was not um, choosing a couple flagships and growing them to a regional basis. Uh, and that the true future of craft was like, fresh and innovative and fresh and um, evolving and this is the perfect spot for that because we have seven barrel tanks where we can 10 cases and that's all we ever can. It's available here and that's it and it's gone in a month um, and if you didn't try it that's sad but there's something new coming out. So you try that instead, and uh, it's all super fresh and delicious. Um, and so sort of being on the forefront of that through the concept of district brew yards is really exciting for those of us who have been brewing beer in this, you know, some iteration of this business for, you know, seven years now. So Around the Bend began life in an alternating proprietorship environment fancy way of saying we shared a brewing environment. Uh, the company we were working with at the time, through no fault of our own, melted down and we had to move on. We ended up developing a contract brewing relationship with Burnt City and this was about two, two and a half years ago. And as we got to work together and got to know each other, uh, Steve Sobel, who is the owner of, around, of, of Burnt City, came to me with this idea. He said, what if we could take and build out a new kind of brewery where we had multiple different tap rooms from different brewing brands all surrounding a courtyard area. And that's where the idea kind of started. It's evolved into, you know, what you'll see here a little bit more uh, in the video today, uh, the current iteration of District Brew Yards where we've got one nice big open space where we all share a single beer hall and each have our own walls where we have 10 different beers where you can pour your own beer. But that really was the nugget of the idea. Let's come together and have a collective where different breweries can come together, share resources, right? Because what we're doing here at Brew Yards, no one of the three of us could do individually, but together pooling our resources and talents and ideas and visions, we can do this, right? So we've made something that, like I said, individually no one of us could have done, but together, you know, the sum of the parts really are greater. Uh, you know, what we kind of strive for with Bulldog is taking a traditional uh, beer and 
putting our twist on it, whether it's different fermentation techniques, whether it's different uh, you know, mashing techniques, different things like that. Um, we typically set out with an idea in mind and then do everything we can to achieve that goal. Um, you know, one of the, there's a long story for it, but uh, I'll try to give you the condensed version. Sherry, my wife, is from Massachusetts. Her hometown had a chocolate factory and everything in Massachusetts has blueberries. So one of the uh, beers that we have not released yet, but it'll be coming up is called Violet. And that is a chocolate and blueberry blonde ale. Um, and that is an idea that stemmed from Sherry. And then I had to figure out how that would work. District Brewyards is like what I like to refer to it as a craft beer wonderland, right? So what do I mean by that? There's more selection here than you're gonna be able to find in any other tap room in the city, just by virtue of the nature that there's three different breweries. But beyond that, it's three different breweries that have a really different take on how we're approaching craft, right? Add on top of that the pour your own piece of it, and people get to determine their own journey here the way they wanna do it, right? If you wanna go and sample one ounce of 30 different beers, if you can stomach that much, great, go for it. If you wanna try a couple things and find a favorite and wanna settle in for a whole pint of that, fantastic. Add on top of that the great uh, food the kitchen's pumping out with our in-house smoked meats, you can't beat it. Just your three yards in one sentence. The home of collaboration and experimentation. Uh, a whole lot of fun with beer. <laughs> a whole lot of beer with fun. District Brewer Rides really is a craft beer wonderland. Welcome there, beer followers and friends, to another episode of Beer Banter. I am here with the crew from District Brew Yards. We're here to have some fun. Some laughs already happened beforehand. A couple, uh, couple blooper reels that you you guys may see uh, later on, may not. Um, no, no, no. We'll keep <laughs> we'll keep those to ourselves. Uh, so we're here. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Brady Potts. I am the shy beer guy. I've got 10 plus years in the bar restaurant industry. I'm a lover of all things craft beer. That's why I'm here today to talk to these lovely people. Uh, so we're gonna go around the room and make introductions. Uh, talk a little bit about your individual brands. We'll talk about District Brew Yards as a whole, as well as some other things going on in the industry. Um, but we'll start with Dan. Hey there, I'm Dan Shudler. I'm founder and owner of Around the Bend Beer Company. I'm uh, Sherry O'Connell. Um, I am the co-founder and co-owner of Bold Dog Beer Company. Uh, my name is Jerome. Uh, I am also a founder of Bulldog Beer Company. I'm Ben Saller. <laughs> um, I'm a founder of uh, Burnt City Brewing. My name is John Saller. I am a founder of Burnt City Brewing. Awesome. Uh, so we went around the room. We're going to just jump right into it. We're, we're going to talk about District Brew Yards as a whole first. Uh, kind of what I said before, guys. We're, we're going to talk about um, what the process was leading up to this for, for each of you guys as individuals and as a brand, um, where you guys are at now. I know you're still early on in the process and your plans for the future as, as a whole. Um. We, we're off to a really, really good start. Uh, we've had tons and tons of people coming through and um, with pretty much universally positive reactions. Um, uh, people are a little taken aback sometimes by the self-poor technology, uh, but they're loving it. And it's really cool to see. We have, uh, we have uh, just a lot of customers coming in with groups of friends, um, sitting down, trying lots and lots of different beers. Right now we have, uh, you know, just shy of 30 beers on tap. Um, we'll have more than that soon. And uh, customers are uh, getting educated by our beer guides on all of our offerings. And they're talking to each other about it too, which is really cool to see. And they're trying them all, which is something that is really unique to this space you know uh we opened how many weeks ago five six six, yeah. six weeks ago in that time we've probably turned over a dozen or more of our taps so in six weeks if you i mean i used to go to bars more than i do 
now, but like there are, are not many bars that I visit more than once every six weeks, right? So if I came here six weeks ago and then I come here today, there are a dozen beers that I haven't tried. Uh, and people are really enjoying being able to go around and pour themselves two ounces of this, two ounces of that, um, figure out what they like, take it home with them, etc. Yeah, it's an awesome concept. I really love the fact that you guys are looking forward in the beer industry, uh, doing something as innovative as self-pour. Um, naturally, my thought going in was it would be a little bit abrasive to those those types of people who just don't know what to expect. And I think expectation is uh, pretty important uh, in this industry. Um, a lot of people are uh, very quick to form their opinions. Uh, so uh, I love that you guys are, are looking forward and adapting to a new model of, of business. Anybody want to branch off on that? Yeah, well, to that point, right, we had some people who, you know, popped off a little bit before we even opened about the model, right? And, and we heard some comments about, you know, well, why would you want to remove the human element from the beer bar experience, right? And that's not in any way, shape, or form what we've done here, right? Um, we have beer guides at each of these walls, as we're calling them, beer guides. Uh, people who are there to, you know, help if there's a problem figuring out the technology, but more importantly, talk to folks about what do you like to drink, you know, help get them into the right beer for that person, or just, you know, generally engage about, you know, any of our brands, tell them our story, you know, really be that, that human element. And so um, it's been great to see you know, how well that's working. I think John made a comment earlier when we were talking about how we've never really seen people talking about the beer with each other as much as we do here, and especially, you know, complete strangers. Go, oh, have you tried this one? You got to try that. Do you like that? You got to try that then. You know, that kind of thing is going on. It's huge here. There's no TVs in this place, which was a conscious choice by all of us to say we want to make this about the experience of connecting over beer because that's what beer has been as a social connector for thousands and thousands of years so that piece of it has been really really cool to see so Jerry nothing well, I was just gonna go back to <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know I go back to the original question of what is brew yards as a whole I don't really see it as a whole I see it as a building uh, where three brands have come together and created something unique maybe that's a synonym for a whole is that is that the Are word i'm looking for yeah yeah <laughs> like a donut hole not really a donut <laughs> what hole what kind of hole are we yeah, talking about <laughs> it's a little sweeter <laughs> I see it more as a building. Oh, no. oh man, they're not going to know what's not really going a on. whole There's whole but... bunch of side conversations. <laughs> uh, yeah, anyways, we need we uh, need more microphones. Yeah, we if need you, more if microphones. You guys have something urgent to say? Just go and grab it. Be aggressive. <laughs> grab the grab the microphone. Uh, I I will say that uh, <laughs> my favorite part about all this is people know who we are. I mean, so that's a very very selfish answer. I understand that, and I apologize to the other breweries, but. Uh, no one really knew who we were before this, and now people are starting to uh, know who we are, know what our beer is, and that's been my favorite part, besides hanging out with Ben. Aw, well, and that's awesome. And, um, I mean, the most important thing about this whole project, I mean, you know, I, I like to go on and on about the amount of experimentation we get to do having our small tanks in the same facility as our, our larger tanks and having our canning line in the same facility as our small tanks so we can can every batch that we make or bottle it and, and sell it in our retail shop and sell it in the beer hall. But the most important thing here is that three breweries have a home and you get to share that home and we have just ideas flying around nonstop yeah. in a way that when i was spending all my time working at our south side production brewery i would encounter outside of uh john and cassie and occasionally greg uh no other humans ever <laughs> <laughs> and um so yeah there's just a lot of energy in here and it's, it's amazing that's awesome I'm sure that helps feed 
to uh, the the brand of District Brewyards, which I mean, although you guys are three separate brands, you you share one brand in this space. Yeah. That's District Brewyards, um, and I like the guy the the way you guys are embracing it. Um, it, it seems like a lot of wide open arms and just a very very uh, welcoming atmosphere. I, I remember being here for the your guys soft opening and. Um, everybody was just enjoying the space and uh, admiring how beautiful it is and, and the innovation that you guys have done. So you want to branch off on that? No? Well, again, just I I would say that my my favorite part about this is not only are we in this in the business aspect of it, but like we've all become really close friends and it's – I, I'm I'm sure everyone can uh, admit like if you're working with people that you enjoy hanging out with, that makes it so much better. And I mean, I <laughs> it, it's just it's it's been fantastic that we've been able to not only bounce ideas off of each other, but learn different techniques, learn different thought processes for brewing. Um, it's been great. Well, and that that <laughs> piece of it. Fuck your room. <laughs> yeah. I would never. <laughs> but no, but that that hey. process just that process I just started. Out. Are we gonna play Mary Fuck Kill later? Or? No, no. Um, that process is just starting though, right? Because what we're six weeks in, and I feel like there's so much runway on that. Like we've been, you know, at first we were brewing, brewing, brewing. You know, as soon as the space, the brew space was done, while this room was still getting built out, just to get ready to open, and then we were. Put the pause button on. We don't want to have so much beer that we, you know, are sitting on it for so long. And then all of a sudden we open and we're like, oh, shit, we got to brew some more beer. So we've been brewing, brewing, brewing. So it's been kind of this, you know, roller coaster. And hopefully that will normalize, you know, now as we kind of get the run rate of it. But I feel like what you were just talking about, you know, that collaboration a uh, aspect of it uh, between the three of us is ju just that it's infancy. And I can see tons of advantages and, and fun stuff going forward absolutely and um yeah I, I think a lot of us are still kind of catching our breath from the enormous amount of work it was to move all of our equipment from our old breweries into this space get it up and running brew enough beer for our opening entertain people at the 20 thousand different opening <laughs> events we had <laughs> and then and then make a whole bunch more beer because we were running out um so yeah what dan says is absolutely true i mean and during that process we weren't we weren't like resting on our, on our uh, like beer formulation laurels uh we were trying new stuff constantly and um and yeah i mean uh, our burnt cities philosophy which i think these guys embrace as well is that you know, we'll have a couple of flagships to distribute, but we, we don't really care that much about making the same beers over and over. We want to try new things constantly and learn from everything we do and use new ingredients in, in, in uh, lots of new batches and study new techniques. And um, uh, we're uh, getting real into the Norwegian farmhouse ale yeast uh, quike uh, to the point where we're going to host a, a, a festival that it's not the first event of its kind in the states but it is uh one of the still new larger scale ones it's a beer festival solely dedicated to celebrating um quike as it's used in uh, th 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 there's some uh dispute there's there's about four different pronunciations floating around this table yeah quiet that's for sure <laughs> That's 100% right. Uh, from what I understand, it's either quike or fike or anyway. The guy who discovered the strains is coming from Norway to give a talk at this well, festival. To say he he'll discovered, well, to say yeah, he discovered is, 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 uh, we, people, My point people is he'll tell really, us how to say uh, it. Yes, and I look forward to meeting Lars Marius Garshall of Lars Blog. Um, he runs a fantastic blog where... This guy is based in Oslo, and um, he travels around Scandinavia and Russia and Eastern Europe and goes to, f like, legit farmhouse breweries where people are using ingredients and techniques that just fly in the face of what a lot of us learned while we were uh, cutting our teeth brewing either at home or 
in commercial breweries um and he just uh he he's very good at, at, at uh conveying like the sort of significance of of not just seeing these brewing uh processes but interacting with the humans that have been largely uh doing this their whole life um so he's coming to give a, a talk um and we have a couple norwegian breweries that are sending beer as well we have breweries from across the country and, and a lot of local breweries as well it's it's not going to be a giant event um we wanted to sort of uh uh dip our toes in the water um but it's shaping up to be super super cool and that's going to be september 7th so yeah. that's very exciting for us to your point uh branching off of what you said in the beginning was that you guys you know aren't really brewing traditional styles um you know you'll do a couple flagships to distribute but your real interest is in using different ingredients and just trying new things i think that caters to a lot of the the consumer market and the way consumers are they they want new things and they want you know different ingredients being used and i think i think there's a, a mutual appreciation on both sides so that's awesome that you guys are are doing that yeah and it's uh, if i may uh, real quick it's it, we're in tricky times where what you just said is completely true and people always want especially with like the more hardcore beer fans people want everything to be something that's never been done before but also there's this like overwhelming push towards it's like like okay your 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 pastry stout or your hazy ipa has to push limits and be like nothing we've ever heard of before but it also has to taste exactly like the beer that got the highest score on beer advocate or fuck that shit <laughs> <And> so <laughs> it's hard to know what to make conundrum of sometimes um but but we have fun trying to strike that balance and it's 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 real uh yeah it's just a shit show right now but we're making a ton of beer and we're loving it. Um, Jerome, I think wanted to go ahead, Dan. Yeah, I, I mean, it's exactly right. The, the the phrase that comes to mind, you know, when when I think about, you know, the the, the current beer customer is promiscuous, right, in the broadest sense of the term, right. That's <laughs> racy, uh, but that's 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 what people are looking for is what's new, what's next, what's new, what's next, all the time, right. And so similarly around the bend. We only have two beers that we make all year round. We've got Vera, our pistachio cream ale, and Villainous, which is a, a sort of a West Coasty IPA, but it's brewed with four different yeast strains, right? So you get this really cool effect going on. But other than that, you know, we're making new different beers all the time, either to send out in cans to distro or, you know, beers that you can only have on the wall here. And that's directly based on that that insight, that learning, what, whatever you want to call it, you know, that that's what the the... The folks out there who are drinking beer today are into. That's what they want. They want us to be using our creativity to think about how can you use different ingredients that aren't traditionally used in beer? How can you apply, as Ben was saying, different techniques, right, that may have been applied for one style of beer but may have a good effect on another, right? That's how Brute IPA was invented out in San Francisco a year and a half ago, right? It's an enzyme that was traditionally used in big, heavy stouts, to get them to be able to ferment faster. And Ken Sturdivan said, well, what if you use that in a, a lighter style to produce something that's more akin to, you know, the, the, the champagne dryness you get out of a brute champagne, right? And that's how that style was invented. And we've been having a ton of fun playing around with that style with our Extra Circus series, so. And, I mean, speaking of Extra Circus, Hopefully you don't take any offense, Dan, but Extra Circus is my favorite beer that you guys do. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's just, it's it's a fantastic beer, and I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, that was the first beer that we package mass produced out of this facility, right? Mass, I, let's not say mass not not mass produced, mass but produced. not mass yeah. produced, but <laughs> but that was the first big canning run yep. in this facility, well, and you know the great thing about Extra Circus is, it's such a good beer. It's so easy drinking. I I, I really really do love that beer. It's like, seven and, I, and, and, and sure. seven and a half percent. Yeah, yeah. Se but yeah. seven and a half percent. I remember you know, having I, I, the, a recent iteration of that. That one of the things that I'm most excited about this entire project uh, is, you know, we have how many different strains of hops out there, but I think. 
the the fun for Sherry and I is not only figuring out what the combination of hops, but really figuring out the combination of the malts and the yeast. I I don't know if we're necessarily there yet as a brewery, but I I would love Bulldog to become not a a hop centric brewery, but a yeast driven brewery because I feel like there's so many unique things you can do with yeast, and I do feel like it's an underutilized uh, ingredient out of the main four ingredients in beer, and that's I feel like there's so many different things you can do, uh, just you know messing with temperatures and messing with pitch rates of different results that you can get and that's what makes me really excited about being able to experiment in a in a space like this is again we two months ago we could do one beer at a time and we couldn't experiment much and now we can be like all right now we're going to brew a beer that is going to do a different process or we're going to use a different yeast and we can throw it up on the wall and see how it's going to do and that makes me very excited um it makes me extremely grateful and uh yeah i mean that's very similar to what we're really excited about in this space which when we moved in here and put you know cassie's revenge our rhubarb barrel aged chardonnay barrel brett uh beer on um saison that's the word <laughs> yeah um, um it was one of the the beers that we had brought over in barrels from the old facility that had been sufficiently aged we have a few more barrels in process that um i mean you know it's a long life cycle for that sort of beer we're we're feeling pretty good about how some of them are tasting to where we feel like we might package them in the next few months um but it's only since we moved in here and started our acid lab which is what we're calling the uh the space that is dedicated to mixed fermentation and the sorts of things that you don't want mixed into your standard equipment you know we've got dedicated tanks dedicated pumps dedicated drains although the drains could be better uh, <laughs> um, and yeah now we're just starting to fill barrels to to replace those beers that we opened with that went really well people were really receptive to them uh, and just sorry, Dan, real, just real quick, um, I think what John was getting at there but didn't maybe really say <laughs> is just in our former location, our, our brew pub in Lincoln Park, um, we had a lot of awesome customers over the years. Uh, we went through a ton of different kinds of beers, but our clientele there um, veered towards the less adventurous um, uh, types of beer drinkers and... Um, uh, well, we didn't have the physical space. <laughs> uh, bop, bop for them on the nose. people to sit and drink beer? For barrels. The barrels that we filled were at our big brewery. What are we talking about? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Go ahead, Dan. I, th I, think, I think what my friends are getting at here is... Wait, I want to <laughs> fall off the rails some more. <laughs> the great thing about this place from a tactical perspective is the flexibility that we have here right so the acid lab is is one of those things right being able to do sour beers mixed fermentation beers over there the space that we have to be able to do barrel aging on a much grander scale the ability to brew as little as seven barrels at a time because we have a seven barrel brew house and a 30 barrel brew house so we can do just seven and it'll never leave the walls here or we can do three turns in our 30 barrel brew house and fill up our 90 barrel fermenters and send those out to you know to you know markets as far away as ohio we have so much flexibility in this building and the net effect for the people who come to drink the beer here is then you're going to get so much variety, right? Which goes right back to that promiscuity piece, right? That's what this allows us to fulfill is exactly what people want because we have these tools and tips and tricks, you know, that no one of, of, of us could have put this all together on our own, but together we've got all this fun stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Sherry, you're real quiet over there. 
Yeah. <laughs> you can you can jump in any time. Any time. Fight for a microphone. You, I do. I get, also get very awkward. Just just get I want to see you get aggressive. <laughs> well, so just get aggressive. What I was kind of just thinking was, you know, sort of piggybacking off of what Jerome had said, you know, we previously had one seven barrel fermenter and that for us was do we like this beer enough to do this, you know, in a huge batch and have this avail- available for distribution? And now that's sort of our, well, let's test batch this. Like, let's just try something out. Let's put it up on the wall. And that's now sort of what we were doing as our large scale is now our small scale. I mean, we had, how many new recipes did we come up with just this month? Uh, this month, five. This month, five. Um. And that's something that's really, really cool for us. You know, we have a lot of recipes that we've sort of like written down and just sort of have tucked away and they're all pretty weird. Um, And so we never wanted to do them on, you know, our big seven barrel fermenter where we were previously because we didn't know if it would sell. And now to have the flexibility to do some of these weirder beers that we just we're really excited for. We don't think we don't know if other people will be, too. Now we can actually make them, and that's weird is good. really cool. Yeah, we like weird. We're weird. Experimentation is good. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's what, in my opinion, and something about me, guys, is, you know, I am a consumer first. So for me, I see things as me as a consumer. And, uh, you know, going off of what you guys, what you just said there, Sherry, experimentation is, is awesome from a, from even a consumer standpoint. And even what uh, Ben said about him, uh, about those guys, you know, not brewing the same beer. It's really, really exciting for me to jump on Facebook or Instagram or whatever your chosen platform is to find out about your favorite brands and see what's new and what's different and what is pushing the boundaries of beer, because that is what this industry is about am i am i right i mean yeah. it, it's about pushing the <laughs> it's about pushing the boundaries and uh you know and and, and really just to, and enjoying the ride enjoying so, so so let me ask you this you know i this is kind of the the phrase that i use a lot is i consider myself a consumer first versus a, a brewer first and one of the things that i feel in my opinion, again, totally my opinion, no one else at the tables, is I feel like we're going to get to a point where beer is not accessible. So I, I, I wonder what everybody's thoughts are on that because I feel like there's getting to be a point where you're paying $24 for a four-pack, and as a consumer, I don't I don't feel like that is sustainable. I'm probably wrong. I guarantee I'm wrong, but that is – a thing that that worries me is like if I'm just the average consumer and I can't afford just a nice good clean beer then what are we doing I guess I consider myself more of a song and dance man um <laughs> I, I, I think that, 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 that um being in the craft beer industry uh we get caught up in the echo chamber that exists with uh uh fanboys um who are great you don't mean that. <laughs> why would you say that they're great they're the salt of the earth they like the best tasting stuff that tastes good and not just the shit that got reviewed the highest or that they can't get because it's intentionally scarce um but (laughs) there will always be the 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 overwhelming majority of beer drinkers are not trying to drink 14 percent stouts made with lactose and vanilla and cinnamon and chili peppers and cardamom and sage and rhubarb and strawberries and donuts and pizza and cake and walnuts and chicken and uh, uh, I was going really good there, but I'm, <laughs> um, I love that people are doing super crazy shit. It would, it, it, I, 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 um, draw a lot of analogies to, to music when I'm talking about beer in this respect, like, um, you always want, or I always want there to be 
like hardcore metal and hardcore punk to push people's boundaries on what is acceptable in terms of like intensity and and offensiveness um is that what i want to listen to all the time no sometimes i just want to listen to bruce springsteen <laughs> but, when, um, but when you when you're talking about adjuncts like adding things that are foreign to beer normally foreign to beer to beer it has to make sense for the style you're brewing with right it does it, yes, it does. Flavor wise, it does. Well, Absolutely. But that's what I'm saying. Just, that's what I'm saying is, yeah. is that, like, what you're saying is true to me, but that's not very punk rock. <laughs> like, 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 sometimes doing shit that's stupid on purpose is what people like. And that's what we're seeing. Stupid on purpose, know, but it only if it works, right? Well, even, even Joe Strummer realized if you that make the a beer song that, isn't going to sound good. If you make a beer good. that tastes like shit by putting stupid shit in it and people line up to buy it, then. Tell I me or not say, whether that works. Like I say no, I say uh, no because I, I, do, I do too. Because that's bu- that's bullshit. Just marketing for marketing's sake. No, uh, and and that's my inclination as well. Right. But I still respect what people are doing along those lines because they're selling beer and uh, they're, and they're pushing boundaries and they're changing the idea of what beer can be. It doesn't make me want to do it, but it right. it is uh, uh, provocative. And, and I appreciate that because I don't like the idea of, of traditions becoming so deeply seated that people are afraid to get away from them. Yeah, I, I, I could agree. No, oh. no, just well, and, I mean, and it, there's been a long history of that in the craft beer oh, sure. tradition. You know, mm-hmm. if you think back to like what Rogue was doing, you know, 20, 30 years ago, some of those things have become recognized styles it's 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 a fine line um i think what what we all agree on here at this table is that we're not just going to throw a bunch of shit that we think tastes bad at the wall to see if something sticks we want to have like a concept that's something that we want to drink um before we put it in the tank um, you know, I think we'd all like to consider ourselves innovative, um, but that doesn't mean that, you know, we're, we're just dumping random things in the tank. And, and you may fail in doing that, to your point earlier, right? You may fail, but at least the forethought is, like, I think X plus Y is going to equal Z, right? Yeah. Your right. hypothesis might not bear out, Right, but if you're just like dumping shit in because it's popular and you don't have any, you know, sort of plan as to how that's going to come out, that's what that's what I find abhorrent. But so all that being said, uh, we are going to start collecting yeast from our bulldogs' wrinkles, and we're going to <laughs> inoculate a beer. <laughs> um, can we use that culture for our Ham Hocktoberfest? <laughs> Because now that we have this smoker, like, we talked about doing a Ham Hocktoberfest before, but clearly, <laughs> we're doing a Ham Hocktoberfest. Yes. I don't think we're going to, though. Are we done? No. <laughs> we're, yeah, we're almost done. Uh, what else do you want to that's, Well, that was, that was some great stuff right there. It's hard, it's hard to branch off from that from the yeast of a bulldog's nose. Um, so that uh, that's an interesting concept. I, w- I want to branch off on that. Um, so the marketing aspect of throwing a bunch of adjuncts in beer, do you think it's it's reached a, a point of novelty? Or And now we're getting into it, right? Now we're getting a little bit more detailed. And we can close it out after this, but I'm just curious. is what Do you think that... Uh, branding and marketing plays more of a factor in uh, those types of beer sales or is it based on prestige or is it just based on the adjuncts alone that people are just really trying to get their hands on and give a try or what so I think I would like it a lot more if and I might get a little flack from this and I apologize if I do or or, you know what I mean Um, I would like it a lot more if instead of throwing food into the mash if there was the steps made to recreate those flavors using normal adjuncts using instead of just 
throwing cake in a beer, do cocoa nibs, do the adjuncts that would make that flavor. I kind of feel like it's yeah. cheating. Not really cheating. Sorry. Nah, yeah. Keep it. The stuff that should be in beer is, it's, in my opinion, what should be in beer. And if you look at the taps in this room right now, at least half of them have some sort of adjunct in them. We use a lot of fruit. We use a lot of vanilla. We use a lot of coffee, all of us. Uh, so, you know, we're not in any way opposed to, to adjuncts. And, and like when it comes to the kinds of beers that we're kind of that some of us are kind of making fun of right now, it's like okay, like you added this thing to the mash. It's like, uh, you know, you talk to the brewers, and if they're being honest, like a, can they taste the difference? That like, I mean, yeah, like I'm sure that like a thousand pounds of like USDA prime ground veal in your fucking <laughs> milk stout really adds something great but most of the time you can't even taste the shit that people are getting and props to them for <laughs> <laughs> props to them for for getting people's attention by doing this like i like i said i genuinely like that people are are pissing me off like but at the same time i'm not like sometimes i have to defend myself with some of our friends who are like super big fanboys it's like i'm not the cranky old man i'm not like fucking clint eastwood like yelling at people to get off my lawn we do new shit all the time it's just like doing crazy shit for the sake of doing crazy shit like i just want beer to taste good i just so, want it what, to taste right. good. that's that's my thing it's, so it's like it's outdated but i want it to taste good like and I want it to feel good inside of me. At what point does it become marketing stunt and not, you know, really additive to the flavor in beer, right? It's kind of like that's kind of where I draw the line for what we're gonna do as a as a as a brand, as a company, right? as a brewery. I'm gonna rustle, ruffle some feathers here, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, well, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that uh, I feel like there's. Uh, there's there's things for the sake of doing things and there's this there's doing things for the sake of creating a profile and what i mean by that is you know one of the things that sherry and i have done before and what we still do is we we come up with a concept of like we want this beer to taste like this right how do we achieve that not just oh hey we want a chocolate blueberry stout so we're just going to throw a chocolate cake that has blueberry icing in the mash. Like, that doesn't make sense to us. We want it to taste like a beer first. That's what this whole thing is about. Again, in our opinion, beer should taste like beer. So how do we develop that profile of, hey, we're going to get the chocolate notes out of this. We're going to get the blueberry notes out of this. How do we achieve that versus we're going to throw a blueberry cake in there? Like, I, I think that's that's kind of where our mentality is at and it I, I I have the utmost respect to the breweries that do that that's that's fine that's not where we want to be um, we want it to make sense and above all beer is beer beer is supposed to be for lack of a better term or lack of better phrase Beer is a common man's drink. Beer is supposed to be the thing that you hang out at a table like this and talk about like we're doing right now. It doesn't need to be the greatest, rarest thing. It needs to be something that starts a conversation and not just, oh, they threw this in there. It needs to taste like beer and rant. So you're saying that I can't just throw a ham hot cake <laughs> into the Oktoberfest and that I like how the fuck am I going to make ham Oktoberfest <laughs> breaking news we are making a pork chop lambic what? Oh, God. well it seems like it seems like you guys are all um, you know I don't want to say <laughs> you guys didn't hear that he said <laughs> drunk little uh, drunk 
It seems like you guys are all kind of on the fence. Like, you know, you understand that the, the I mean, end consumers, you know, says all, essentially. You know, people people like to drink what they like to drink. If they're drinking hazy IPAs, you know, it's it's up to you guys as a brand to produce that type of thing or a super, super overly adjuncted but hold on, but the hazy IPA thing is an awesome example of, like, when the hazy IPA thing hit, there were some people doing a great job of it on the East Coast. When it first hit the Midwest, people were doing a bad job of it. People were doing all sorts of dumb shit to try to make their IPAs hazy, and they tasted bad. And then people, <laughs> then a few people started to figure out how to do it well, um, and then a lot of people started to figure out how to do it well, and then it became common knowledge that what's actually going on there is you're not dumping flour into your beer to make it hazy. What you're doing is active ferment dry hop, which actually, with the right yeast strain, which actually has a chemical process that creates new compounds that make it hazy. It doesn't drop off. Biotransformation creates new flavor compounds that are unique to hazy IPAs. All of a sudden, it's a fantastic new go, style, go, go. and we <laughs> love it. And we, like, yeah, we absolutely love it because it's legit. Um, so, so it's that, becoming that's a little bit where... more legit than it, than it was much to your point. I mean, <laughs> it's, I, I think the, the question, even for me as a consumer is, is how do you, how do you uh, create longevity in that style? Right? <gasps> well, that's what I'm saying. Some styles have longevity. Some styles don't, uh, hazy IPAs have longevity. Um, well, no, but there will always be some, some the, in the same way, like, okay, like, like. Uh, uh, black IPAs. That was definitely a fad, but they will, they'll persist a little. There's a lot of, I would, a lot of I comparison would... to that style, that trend. Um, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't see the, the hazy trend as being akin to the black IPA trend at all. Um, I, I think early on I kind of did, and just like what John was saying, like, I, I was like, what is this? garbage this was a few years ago and then a buddy of mine sent me some like treehouse and uh other east coast ipas and sent them to me fresh and i was just like all right first of all this treehouse ipa is definitely hazy but doesn't look like pea soup and also is extremely delicious and doesn't taste like what i've had before um i think that maybe over time people's um use of the visual cue for making judgments about what the flavor will be will will level off a little bit but the techniques used in making hazy ipas and and the the yeast like i mean i've been thrilled uh to to make to realize that you can make really good hazy ipas with a couple different quike strains not to keep steering it back towards that but uh um i think i think black ipas were a trend because they were jarring and were something different they have it, it's pretty hard to make a black ipa that doesn't have a really aggressive flavor a kind of abrasive flavor that where there's any reason for it to be a black ipa uh but with the hazy ipas like John mentioned to coax certain flavors out of the the yeast, out of the hops, that, or the combination of them, really. Like, um, yeah, using using London Three or or uh, the, the Conan or now the False Quike and Hornendal Quike. Um, yeah. Like, uh, yeah, uh, it's been uh, really cool to, to experiment with that. But, you know, like Brady was saying earlier, right, so, you know, do we have to, you know, get on the trend that consumers are driving this notion of, you know, hazy IPA, so we have to make one? You know, there's business considerations for that, so certainly it's something to think about. But every great innovation in whatever category you're talking about in, 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 in life in American business has always been founded on something that customers consumers didn't know they wanted all right so uh like i was saying you know i uh years ago i was skeptical of, of hazy ipas and then i got to try some really good examples of like treehouse and 
couple other uh, like heavy hitter East Coast hazy IPA uh, breweries, and uh, now um, now like after kind of figuring out some of the techniques that are involved in in making those beers, really kind of like I, I use this term too often, and I, I worry that I annoy people around me, but to make the flavors pop in those beers. Um, uh, uh, yeah, like now introducing um, Quike. Uh, it's okay, into, guys. They're uh, brothers. Into uh, um, into like the the Narwhal Picnic and the Quike Minded. Like we use two different Quike strains in those two different IPAs with different combination of hops, and they're delicious and they're unique, and they don't taste like uh, they're not like modeled after the archetype like like hazy ipa from uh you know uh x brewery i'm not gonna say a name of a brewery because i probably like that brewery and that beer and i don't want to make it sound like i'm ranting against them but it's like everybody's like just trying to copy everyone and we don't want to do that we want to engage with current trends and and with beer drinkers passions for certain styles but we want to we want to push it in like directions where things haven't been done before and i just sorry i really need to issue a correction here when i mentioned black ipas that was sort of the opposite part of that where with hazies there's a thing that you can incorporate into awesome beers in the way that ben was just talking about black ipas were sort of a strange one-off where you know maybe they persist but there's nothing to add to future generations of brewing so two things, piggybacking off of that, uh, our black IPA, Midnight Warrior, coming soon. First, <laughs> <laughs> the plug. We do what we want. The plug. Uh, but 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 two, we we've established we can we can curse on this podcast, right? We can curse on this. Oh yeah, like a sailor. All right. Uh, so <laughs> like a I will. <laughs> oh! I like that. Uh, I'm so drinking I, a lost I, I sailor. Be, I will be the first person to admit <laughs> the first time we tried to do a hate. I'm getting there. <laughs> He's fucking getting there. I will be the first one to admit the first time we did a hazy, we fucked up. And you know what? I, I, I will go out and say we fucked up. And that was it was like three weeks. That was probably the darkest period of our brewery because we got nothing but negative reviews on untapped and it was just like every day like not hazy enough not hazy enough not hazy enough that shit sucks and we had to go back to the drawing board and refigure out what we were gonna do and you know okay fine is is the name of the beer that we did we fucked up this is it now I mean, the lighting is not the greatest, but this is our hazy, and this is what we're very proud of. This is our number one seller at the brew yards because we realize we fucked up. We realize, like, hey, we need to go back to the drawing board for this. There, I will be the first one to admit, I thought hazies were a fad. I didn't think they were going to stick around, and we had a bunch You're of our accounts. The first one. Yeah, yeah, and we're not the first one. We probably won't be the last one, but... We had our accounts that are like, when are you going to brew a hazy? When are you going to brew a hazy? When are you going to brew a hazy? Okay, fine. And that's where this beer comes from. And I'm so happy with where this beer is at. I love this beer. And I think this is one of our best offerings that we have. Is this what we hang our hat on? I don't think so. But is this a beer that we're extremely proud of? And is this a beer that we've not only realized our flaws that we had and recognized what we had to do to improve, we've done that. And we've gotten it to a point where we love this beer. And I, I don't know if I can say any, anything else about it. It's just, it, it is what it is. It's a natural progressive or progression. And I feel like if you, for lack of a better phrase, if you, if you pigeon yourself, pigeonhole yourself into a certain style you're not going to be able to grow as a brewery and that's what we want to do is we want to become the best brewery that we can become and if we have to explore different techniques of brewing a hazy to make people drink our bavarian amber or our belgian golden strong fine that's fine uh real quick guys where we are 
uh, rolling in the last couple minutes here. So sorry for ranting. We're gonna no, we're good. We're good. Uh, we got a lot of good stuff uh, here this time around. And uh, thank you guys. Before we conclude, I just want to say thank you guys for sitting down, being so being so hospitable, um, just really doing your part in helping me provide uh, some information to the craft beer industry and, and consumers uh, alike about you guys and um, just about some real cool stuff that you think is going on. So thank you guys. I it's appreciate good it. hanging out. Yeah. 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 This was cool. This was a lot of fun. Um, uh, let's r- roll into our wrapping up. Um, any closing statements that you want to make about brew yards, about the beer industry, about you guys as individual brands, or individual people. Everybody's somewhere. everybody's got to say something. So Sherry, you're you're you got to jump in. Wait, no, I don't want to start. I don't know what I want to say. All right, okay. Um, I'll I'll start. Um, it's been. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> the the last seven years, seven to eight years, when uh. When um, my brother and I and our, our partners have been plotting the existence of our of our first brewery uh, up until now has been a grind and it's been an adventure and it's been crazy and it's been very gratifying and it's been extremely stressful and I just like I'm just blown away by how well everything here has come together the brewery itself the beer hall um people's response to it working with around the bend and bold dog it just um it just doesn't even seem real to me yet because it's it's just so good like i i don't uh I'm not a pessimist, but I'm not an optimist and like i I just will vouch for that i I just uh try to try to just take things for what they are, and it's just unbelievable to me that that everything is happening the way it is right now, like we're just making so much good beer and people are drinking the hell out of it and what could be better than that? Um, yeah, I mean, I would say for some reason, this is the first thing I just kind of thought of. Um, my fam- I'm originally from the East Coast. Um, my family actually came out to visit, and they came here for the first time recently. Um, and I think for them to really see, you know, like I said, they're, they're a thousand miles away. So they really, everything they've seen has, has sort of just been like, things we've posted on social media or things we've you know mentioned and I don't think that for a while we were taken super seriously um I think that just because we were so small all that a lot of people just thought you know I mean even six months ago we tried to get our beer in somewhere and they just asked if we were just home brewing um you know we've been on the market for about two and a half years so it's kind of it's it's almost valid Foundation. I don't know if that's the right term, um, but to sort of see our hard work pay off and, you know, for me to have, you know, my family actually see our hard work pay off. Um, you know, my dad bought like two cases of beer, a bunch of hats and some t-shirts and like handed them out to a bunch of his friends and stuff back home. Um, so that was really cool. Um, but, you know, that's for me, that's sort of been something that's been Really neat. Yeah. Hashtag neat. Uh, I'm the guy in the beer store who is checking the dates on the bottom of the six pack to see whether I want to buy the beer. Uh, And so when we were starting this off, I was always pumping the brakes saying, make less beer, make less beer. It's way better to run out of beer than it is to serve old beer. We can't have old beer. We can never have old beer. It has to be fresh. It has to be fresh. It has to be fresh. Um, and then beer. What? Fresh. I think I think he means fresh. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> you guys God are damn it. Crazy. <laughs> um, so anyway, then we opened. Then people drank all the beer. Then we had to brew a bunch of beer. 
but but Fresh. what has been really fun here is to be able to brew a whole fuck ton of beer and have it stay fresh because people are actually coming in here and buying it as fast as we make it uh and i hope that that continues like ben said it's it's kind of mind-blowing like how well things have been going here but for me that's that's all about being like we we launch a new beer i think i am gonna drink so much of this it's gonna be so awesome and then it's gone i'm like no wait i wanted to drink more of that and then and then, but then there's something else that's new and fresh. And I'm like, oh, 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 oh I'm going to drink you instead. <laughs> um, and it's, it's amazing. No, I'm not going to drop a beat. Uh, all I'm going to say is um, this, this has been the best thing that's happened to Sherry and I. Um, I mean, oh, no, 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 no. I mean, to be fair, audience, uh, our baby is due August 23rd, so that's going to be... I think a what? That is... P- that's why they're needs to get after you? Yeah. We didn't let you know, but... Name surprise but, party. Uh, I, I mean, in closing, uh, this is truly the best thing that's happened to us so far um our you know, until august you know our our first date was closing down dry hop and then closing down a dive bar drinking sam adams oktoberfest so our relationship is based around beer besides that i mean we we have Which been is just a really fancy way of saying we're basically functioning alcoholics Tomato, tomato. <laughs> and you can, Except for your sherry right you now. You could admit it. Um, but at the same time, like, I, 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 none of this has felt real to me yet because we are in such an awesome situation where we not only get to brew multiple types of beer, multiple styles, multiple, you know, countries that – specialize in different styles we haven't gotten to lagers yet but that's something we really want to explore but we've gotten to the point where we can brew what we want to drink but also provide that to the consumer where the consumer is drinking our beers people are knowing who we are um i just can't say enough positive things about not only being a part of the brew yards but like I mentioned it earlier, like, we've all become friends here. Like, I I love hanging out with everybody here. I love everybody that's a part of the brew team. Uh, <laughs> wow. Like, I just, I feel so goddamn lucky. And I hope that uh, everybody that's watching this will not only come and visit us, but... Uh, seek us out because we make the best beer in my opinion (laughs) no we just make the best beer we make the best beer be bold be bold jerome be bold (laughs) if you don't like our beer then you're wrong (laughs) not really but i mean you are and evil evil. excellent excellent and dan's got something to say yeah, I'll, and I'll keep it short. And all I'm going to say is if if you've been to District Brew Yards already, come back. Because as John was saying earlier, in a two, three, four-week period, there's there's not an entire turnover, but there's a lot of new beers here that you haven't had. And if you haven't been here yet, you've seen the evidence, you know, over the last, how, how long have we been talking? Uh, about why you should come, <laughs> right? Uh, it, it, it really is a fantastic place. We want you to... Uh, we want you to experience the fruits of our labors, uh, and that sounds cheesy a little bit, but it's it's true. Um, this is this is hard damn work, and uh, everyone at this table is 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 pouring their blood, sweat, and tears into it. Uh, there's no millionaires at this table, minus me. Yet, uh, and um, yeah, we love what we're doing, so we'd love to see you down here. So please come down. Awesome. Um, 
So closing statement from me, again, thank you guys for, for joining me. This was a good time. I appreciate it. I always enjoy the authentic aspect of, of what I do is meeting brewers and owners alike and, and really just getting real with them about what what drives their brand, what drives them as people, because at the end of the day, we're all people, right? And beer is what brings us together as people. So uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed this episode of Beer Banter. Uh, again, I'm with the crew uh, from District Brew Yards, Around the Bend, Dan, Dan from Around the Bend, uh, Ben and John Saller from Burnt City Brewing, uh, John, or excuse me, Jerome, sorry, Jerome and Sherry Stunts of Bulldog Beer Co. Uh, thank you guys for joining. I appreciate it. We'll do one big cheers. I know some of, some of us are out of beer, but we'll do one afterwards as well. That's okay. Uh-oh. He's superstitious. All right. Hashtag drink Chicago beer. Um, we appreciate you guys. I appreciate you guys. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this episode. Thank you, Brady. Peace, guys. Peace. Dive into.